morning, everybody. I don't think I've ever had an introduction like that. Thank you very much, Gail. Um, there are things, two things that Gail forgot to mention, uh, neglected to mention. One was that, um, as well as having um, lots of enthusiasm, I also have lots of colleagues and, um, and students who actually help with a lot of the work. So this talk is a product of their work and uh, they take the, the glory from uh, the efforts and the outcomes and I'll take the blame for any misinterpretations of their good work. Uh, the other thing that she neglected to say is that I do work across a number of areas um, but actually I'm a bit of a fraud because forecasting isn't one of them. So I figured that it was really great to take this uh, invitation because I'd like to present to you some of the problems that I'm working in uh, that perhaps over the course of the next couple of days you could share some of your insights and, uh, and maybe help me out. So uh, I'd like to talk about uh, looking back forward, backward and sideways and about the, and this in the context of Bayesian forecasting and hopefully that title, the meaning of that title will unfold throughout the presentation. So before I, uh, I start, maybe, this was working. Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence in Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers. This centre brings together seven different universities across four states of Australia. Uh, it brings together people from mathematics, statistics and machine learning to work across the pipeline from, uh, from theory through methods in computing through to applications. There's a seven year horizon, we have about 50 investigators and about 50 students in the centre. So this is a, a great opportunity for us to bring together these different arms of mathematical sciences to work on problems in healthy people, sustainable environments and prosperous societies. I'm also part of the Bayesian Research and Applications Group, our BRAG group at QUT. We're interested in modelling, uh, different areas of modelling. We're also interested in computation um, and we're also interested in applications. And so this is an amalgam of these different uh, research areas and interests that I'll talk about today. I'm, uh, in Bayesian modelling, uh, it's really just the way that I think about the world now and, and do much of statistics, not all, but, uh, but a lot of the research. And I've got two different ways of formulating the same problem here. You can see here I've got P of theta, where theta is our um, parameters or our unknowns. It could be missing data, it could be the model choice, it could be the parameters of a model. And we're given some data Y or some information Y. And we can think about that then as just very simply from Bayes' rule, incontrovertible, we have P of Y given theta, so our data given this, these unknowns, times probability of the unknowns. What do we know about those unknowns um, before we, independently of the data, divided by some normalizing constant P of Y? So if we think about it this way, then we're starting with a model or some representation of our system and then we're saying, what do we know about the parameters of that system outside, or the unknowns of that system, outside of the data, or independent of the data? So we can think about Bayesian modelling from that perspective, or we can think about it just in a sort of slight turn, about starting with our, what do we know about the, the, the system parameters 
and then adding the information, the data, to that. So why do I put it that way? Well, this, this way here is actually the way that we might think about our iterative learning or updating in a Bayesian framework. So we start with some information, and, um, and then we say that's our prior belief. Or we start with some, some prior understanding of the system. We gather some information, and we update that to give us a new understanding of the unknowns or the parameters of the model. We then take that as our prior and we get more data and we update again. So in this way we're continuing this iterative updating in a very formal and very understandable way. So just these two very different ways of seeing the same equation gives us different ways that we might think about problem solving in a Bayesian context. So, um, I said in the abstract that I would start with a little bit of a, a history of, um, of Bayesian forecasting and Bayesian modelling, so I'd just like to start with this one slide which says that um, in, uh, we had Bayes to start with in Bayesian modelling. Uh, Bayes, in, the, in these early days, it was called probability theory, and this was really this idea of what can we learn about the unknown parameters given the data. And so, um, Bayes and Laplace, this uh, solid line here is really the, the, uh, the trajectory of Bayesian modelling. Bayes and Laplace constructed this, uh, this uh, framework, and there were two main objections to it. One was the idea of priors, and how do we set up an objective prior, and how do we understand the role of priors, this P of theta. And there was a lot of debate and criticism about this, and the other one was in computation. How do we actually do something, the computations, uh, apart from a very simple model? Well, Bull and Venn uh, were, were key players in trying to solve some of these problems about the, uh, the priors. In the meantime, we had probability theory translating into inverse probability, and Fisher and Neyman started the frequentist frame, uh, framework of thinking where we just focus on P of Y given theta and we make some inferences about or maximizing the, the probability of theta uh, in that, from that uh, likelihood equation. So we have then the rise of frequentist uh, uh, statistics here. Meanwhile, we had Jeffries here. Uh, so, so here's where we really had about prior. So Jeffries. Um, was developing a whole framework for um, priors and objective priors. And Geeman and Geeman were, began the real revolution in computation. So we had algorithms then, MCMC and other algorithms that enabled us to actually do Bayesian analysis. So we had Gelfand and Smith then who really started to form those um, algorithms and those models in a way then that we could create our modern Bayesian statistical analysis. And of course now we have a today's Bayesian, for example, uh, Gale here. So um, we put Gale on the same sort of pedestal here oh. as, uh, as uh, Bayes. And so we'll see then in the future, for you, you'll be looking at this trajectory here and taking Gale over here somewhere. No. Okay. <laughs> So looking back, and I said that I'd talk a little bit about a brief history of forecasting, and again, I thought I'd do this on one slide by looking into ASIMs. I started looking at this and I thought, you guys know all about this history of forecasting. So what I thought I'd do is just mention a couple of the people in our Centre of Excellence who are working in this area. So obviously Rob is here, so I'm not going to, to mention um, his work so much, and you obviously know about him, Robert Conn as well from University of New South Wales, and John Gavecki. So I just mentioned John's paper of over 10 years ago here in Bayesian Forecasting in the Handbook of Economic Forecasting because I like this line, I was going back in history to find this, this is 10 years ago, it's a long time, and he says, one of the, um, the, uh, the chapters he has is, it was not always so easy, a historical perspective, so I thought, well, this could go on for a while. And I, you've got a, a, a listed here the kinds of topics that, um, that were being talked about even 10 years ago. And the reason I'm doing this is because I think that these topics are still topics of investigation now, just the same as the topics of priors 
and computation are topics that are really under investigation in the Bayesian framework. So I want to go even further back in time, just slightly further than, um, than the three people who were up on the, the, uh, the, the previous slide, and go into a galaxy far, far away. And I don't know if any of you have seen the, the clip of, um, of Star Wars, well, maybe some of you have seen the Star Wars movie, but there is a clip, a YouTube clip, um, as well as in the movie, that talks about um, the, uh, the pri going through this, uh, this uh, sea of, um, of meteorites. And so what happens here is that C3PO, uh, C3PO says, Sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. And Hans says, never tell me the odds. <laughs> so why am I putting this up? Well, I want to go through this just to see what was happening in this galaxy far, far away. So here's my brief history of Bayesian analysis. So in C3PO's mind then, C3PO just doesn't make numbers up. He's fluent in over 6 million forms of communication. And so his odds that he gave there was actually rep implying imperfect data. So what's, let's say that he has some records here. He has two people survive and 7,440 people explode going through this asteroid field. So what does that look like in terms of a distribution? Well, here's C3PO's data backed beliefs. Here's a beta distribution, so it goes from 0 to 1, the probability of success. So one's sort of out here somewhere or other. This is the probability of success, is a beta with two successes and 7,440 failures. So this is C3PO's pessimistic prior. This is the consequence of not having a Bayesian prior. What's going to happen to Hans? They will explode. But Will Kurt, in his um, article on, on, the, um, on the web, he has a very nice article on this, says the probability that Hans will succeed is actually 20,000 to 1. So his probability here, his prior probability of success, looks like this. So what happens now if we combine C3PO's probability of success on his database prior versus this um, Will Kurtz prior here for Han's probability of success? So what we have then is the likelihood um, of beta 2, 7,440 from C3PO. We have a prior of a beta 20,000 to 1. And a posterior then is going to be the combination of this likelihood and this prior through Bayes' theorem. And what we end up with then is, lo and behold, this probability here, this beta distribution, which is a 75% chance of survival. So that's why Hans <laughs> says, never tell me the odds without first establishing a Bayesian prior. So, even back then, they're talking about Bayesian priors. So let's think about priors then, and we have a number of forms. As I said, there was a lot of discussion in early days, and it still continues now, about objective priors, particularly when we have small numbers. So for example, if I'm in a situation where I have zero successes out of n trials, how do I put an interval around that? We're in a classic frequentist situation and the way that I might think about understanding the uncertainty about that uh, observation is to think about the prior that I would impose on the probability of success. And if I want an objective prior then, there are a number of options that I can have for that and uh, those options will obviously have some influence on my outcome. So that debate still reigns, and it's some work that's um, been done by a, a student and colleague of, my, of mine uh, in the area of objective priors. And this still matters because we're still interested, even when we've got a lot of data, often we're interested in the small groups, that the target groups are tiny. And often we are in the situation where we want to understand the uncertainty of those small groups um, in light of the other information that we might have about the system. 
We go from objective priors to priors which are vague or non-informative, so they have some structure but don't influence the uh, results, so we let the data speak, to partially informative priors to fully informative priors. So the idea of objective prior, uh, let me just go through, these are the um, plausible objective priors, and you can see here something like a beta 1, 1, so a uniform. We have um, a beta 0, 0, so it's going to have probability at 0 and 1, and a Zellner prior. So different kinds of objective priors, and these are some of the recent papers on this topic. So this is still very much an area of, um, of interest. Partially informative priors are also an area of interest, and I'd like to talk a little bit about ways that we've been thinking about these. So just think for a moment about the classic problem of having animals with different doses um, and they're supposed to be um, exposed, they're exposed to a toxin. So the animals then, the number of animals that are going to be killed at a particular dose level is going to be binomial. We have five animals, there's some probability of death at that level, at that toxin level, and we can model that then through a logistic regression. The question is, what kind of priors do I put on my parameters? Well, one option is a Cauchy prior. And so if I write this Cauchy prior then, I can write it with a mean of zero, and here are some just different Cauchy priors with different means and, uh, and dispersions. And then the question is, what dispersion do I put on this? Again, in this sort of small case setup. Well, um, that's one question, and now I go into the high case setup, the high observation setup, and I might have a now a high dimensional regression problem where now I'm interested in putting priors on the parameters in this regression. So what kind of priors would I put in here that would induce sparsity or reduction in the number of um, variables? I could think about having um, a horseshoe prior. So you can see here this kind of shape which is very peaked around zero. So I'm forcing these regression parameters to be close to zero. The question is, what are the parameters that I would put on this prior? So one way that we can think about this is to ask the question, what's a reasonable choice of a prior distribution from this parametric class? And we can consider a prior predictive distribution, for example, and perhaps use history matching. So this idea of history matching is very common in many areas, as you can see there, and it goes like this. I take a parameter of interest, theta, and I take a class of prior distributions, so I saw Cauchy's or horseshoe priors. And the problem is to choose these hyperparameters, lambda. So I'm going to treat the problem as one of model checking for hypothetical data. So there are five steps in this. I choose a set of summary statistics based on the data that I would observe. So I haven't seen any data yet, but I'm going to, to, um, to think about what I would care about in the data that I would observe. Uh, and then for each statistic, I'm going to specify the set of values that would be considered surprising if they were observed. Then I'm going to take my prior predictive distribution for those summary statistics, and I'm going to compute the probability of being in those regions of surprise for that summary statistic. So I'm going to, to, um, to generate a lambda, and I'm going to then simulate some data from my prior predictive distribution and see if the summary statistic lies in the region of surprise or no surprise. If it lies in the region of no surprise, if I'm generating data that gives a summary statistic that I'm not surprised about, then I'll keep those hyperparameters. Okay? So then I can make a decision then based on some threshold about the degree of surprise. And what I end up with then is a distribution of hyperparameters that's giving me a, um, data, hypothetical data, uh, that I would not be surprised about with respect to these uh, summary statistics. So how do we do this? If you think about the way that I've been talking about this, then this is a, um, sensibly a form of approximate Bayesian computation 
are all similar, so SMC, for example. So what do we do then if we come to that logistic regression case? We might take as our summary statistics the sum of the variances of the responses, and we might say, I would be very surprised if all of the, um, ex uh, the ex estimated Ps, the probability of death, um, are either 0.01 or 0.99. I would not be surprised if the Ps were smooth. So I've got these levels of toxin, and I might be expecting that the probabilities are smooth in some way across that range. So once I set that up, then I can compute these predictive p-values for the summary statistics over a grid of values for the lambdas. And I can see where the intersection of the, um, the p-values, the ones that are um, not surprising, uh, occur. So then I can get values of lambda 1 and lambda 2 for my hyperparameters that will induce this, are likely to induce data hypothetical data that's, um, that's com uh, complementary to my beliefs. So this is a way then of having these sort of partially informative priors. If I think about the sparse shrinkage regression, I can do the same thing. So what would be surprising here? I can set up summary statistics that would be surprising and summary statistics that would be not surprising. And again, I can look at the range of hyperparameters that would give me a not surprising set of summary statistics. So I can extend this idea then to Bayesian model criticism, where if I think about how I would usually go about Bayesian um, model comparison or model criticism, goodness of fit, I would com uh, compare some function of the observed data to a reference predictive distribution, so it could be a prior predictive distribution or a posterior predictive distribution. I can summarise the result of the comparison in the form of a p-value, and then the only problem with that then is that I need to simulate from this reference distribution, as I've said before with those two examples, I need to simulate um, in, uh, from that many times in order to see whether I'm going to get something that's surprising or not surprising. So this is of the, of, um, often computationally intensive, and so we've been working on ways of getting over that, um, for example, through uh, extensions to ABC, uh, which in this case was regression adjustment ABC. So just as an example, um, a capture-recapture study, uh, we used a discrepancy measure there, and looking um, like this, so this is just the difference between the square root of the observed values and what I would expect here. Uh, so this is for the number of animals captured in year I and recaptured in year J. And, um, and then by using this regression adjustment approach uh, and this idea of, uh, then I can look at, I can come up with an approach that is four to five times faster than the usual approach. So this is just an extension of the ABC method that I talked about before. So this is work in progress that's trying to come up with ways of understanding how we can formulate priors that are not necessarily uh, fully objective, but are partially informative. So why do I care about this? Why do I care about these um, priors that might work when I have zero successes out of a number of failures, a uh, number of trials? Why do I care about partially informative priors? And this is where I would like some, um, some input from you, is that we're building a, an atlas of cancer. We have a, this will be for the first time in Australia, an online atlas of cancer, many different cancers over many years, and we're interested in looking at um, how we, uh, so for the first time, people will be able to go to the, their area and identify their probability of survival, so their relative survival. Um, and we want to be able to use priors in this case, which are like smooth spatial priors, so based on the neighbourhood of each area, because we have small numbers, we can use the neighbourhoods of each area to... Um, to uh, better, uh, provide better estimates, more robust area estimates, and Bayesian cons uh, consistent estimates uh, for different areas. And we also want to be able to establish trajectories or patterns over time in those cancers. Now, many of those cancers are rare. 
So I have a lot of data in this case. I have over 2,000 different regions of Australia to estimate, but I have a, a very small population in many of those areas and an even smaller number of cancers, so often zeros. So this is a question then that is really important for us if we're going to come up with, with sensible estimates of incidence and relative survival for this national atlas of cancer. I want to move now to looking sideways and thinking about dealing with big data, which is something that, um, that we've been, or we're all challenged with, and also the many names of forecasting. So just in terms of big data, with the Bayes and big data algorithms, we have MCMC and all of its variants, uh, and subsampling for MCMC to overcome the problem of big data. We have approximations now which are becoming of intense interest. Uh, so instead of doing the full Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms, the simulation-based approaches, there are approximations such as variational Bayes, ABC that I've talked about, sequential Monte Carlo Gaussian processes, and um, integrated nested Laplace approaches. Different ways that we might look at Bayesian algorithms. We can also think about um, com computational approaches, so fast facilitation in terms of divide and conquer, divide and recombine. There are delta rho approaches, so for example, Bill Cleveland has, um, has this package uh, that uh, maps onto R and, uh, um, and also consensus Monte Carlo, bag of little bootstraps, parallel MCMC combine and so on. Optimization is fast replacing estimation in many cases. Uh, and through, through um, approaches such as gradient descent and stochastic approximations and various extensions and alternatives. We still need the Bayesian framework in a big data uh, context because we still want to do error checking. We still want to understand uncertainty because there still is uncertainty. We want to be able to understand the quality of the data and we want to understand how to combine those data. And all of those uh, features are natural in a Bayesian framework. We can look at scalability as well, so through a range of different approaches we look at speed and we can also then try to synthesize some of these different models um, through libraries of these uh, in statistical software. So um, these slides will be available with the references as well. There are still ongoing challenges, I've mentioned some of them. These are some others in a paper by uh, Fan, Han and Liu Yu a couple of years ago, dealing adequately with the accumulation of errors um, and spurious patterns in high dimensional data, continuing to improve computational and algorithmic efficiency and scalability, and accommodating heterogeneity, experimental variations and statistical biases associated with combining data from different sources using new technologies. So, for example, with the um, Institute of Sport now, we're looking at sensors and wearables, um, video cameras, motion detectors, and so on, ways that we might bring these new technologies to bear on the analysis of sport and, and um, prediction of, um, of outcomes for athletes. Uh, but when I look at this list for big data and working in this area a little bit, just a little bit, you, know, you sort of get a bit tired because of their challenging problems. So um, what I thought was maybe we can avoid the problems. So I'd like to tell you about two ways that we're looking to do that. One of it is in ways of combining data. So we've been looking at using Bayesian networks as a way of um, being able to combine data in a sort of reduced or summarized probabilistic format. And here's how it goes. The context of this is um, just uh, one of many ways that we've been using these networks is this one. And this is something we're working on right now and um, would, again, like your help with. So we want to be able to look at, uh, we have the Barrier Reef, which is on our doorstep, literally now. Um, and we have a, an issue with dredging uh, for, uh, for mining and for ports. Uh, so we have a big mining industry in Queensland, we're dredging the ports uh, for boats to come in for the mines and this is affecting the, the seagrass and the reef. So the question is, can we, instead of banning the dredging, can we come up with optimal times for dredging? So period windows for dredging that would have least impact on the seagrass. 
And can we then model the cumulative impacts of those different dredging scenarios? So we want to combine data from many sources for very many different seagrass and coastal sites worldwide. And there are three criteria that we're looking at. Resistance, recovery, and persistence. So the way that we're doing this is through a Bayesian, dynam a dynamic Bayesian network. We take our Bayesian network, which is we have a response. We ask what are the factors that affect that response? What are the factors that affect those factors? This becomes then like a conceptual model. And then we quantify it with conditional probability tables. So we take each node and we just think about the parents of that node and we can then form a conditional probability table for G, conditioning on the states of E and F. And if we do that for each node in the model, and then we run the probabilities through the network, we come up with an overall marginal probability for the outcome of interest here. So we've used these, uh, basic networks have been used in many areas. We've um, looked at just a very um, small number of these, which are the ones in red here. And um, one of the examples that I'll show you that we've, we've uh, worked on is in inbound air passenger process. We have here very different kinds of data, so we want to stop that whole congestion problem that we're all very familiar with in an airport. We have many different kinds of data and we want to be able to incorporate this in some formal model. So we're using networks to do this. So um, this, we think about the processes that we go through when we go through um, uh, inbound uh, uh, coming into a country. And then we look at, for each of those processes, what are the factors that affect the flow through that, or the facilitation of passengers through that process. We can then quantify each of those factors based on the variety of information that we have using those probability tables, and then we can flow all of that information down to an overall passenger dwell time, taking into consideration the KPIs that are of interest to the airport and the airlines, and of course the passengers. So an airport's um, Bayesian network then can be built up of these sub-networks and we quantify them as I, as I said um, and we get the condition, we quantify conditionally and then we obtain the marginals and we can then do forward inferencing. So we can say what if I set different um, nodes to different settings. So um, well, under a particular scenario, what would these different nodes look like and how would that impact on the overall outcome? We can then look at um, the, the overall impact at different parts of the network and we can also then um, just go, we can also do it backwards. So we can say using our, because this is um, a Bayesian framework now, we can say conditioning on our outcome, what would be the probability states for the input nodes that would give me that outcome. So now we're just turning that Bayesian handle again to come up with what would be some optimal settings for this very complex system that would give me the desired outcome. And from that then we can look at prediction of dwell time in each area. We can look at the total number of people in each area through this Bayesian network. And we can also come up with a dashboard, which is how stressed is your airport, and this is what we're up to at the moment. There's a YouTube clip if any of you are interested in looking at just what we're, where we're up to with this kind of predictive model for airports uh, using Bayesian networks. Coming back to our seagrass problem now, we've done this also, but now it's in this dynamic setup. So we have this time component uh, in our network, we build up the Bayesian network and now it becomes a non-homogeneous uh, dynamic Bayesian network to model the multiple system transition rules for decline and recovery. So we have the seagrass is going to decline and recover naturally, but then also um, with the impact of dredging. So what we can end up with then is a map for the seagrasses across the world uh, so the green is the seagrasses here, and we can look at the average recovery time and the average ratio to extinction risk to baseline risk. 
uh, so we can look then at uh, for these particular um, parameters of interest, we can look at these with different dredging periods. So one month, two, three, six, nine or twelve months for different species of seagrass here. Um, this is one way that we've been looking at how to visualise that. So we have a seagrass population resilience responses. We have three sites here. We have different dredging scenarios here. So dredging just for one month, oh, sorry, for no months. One month, two months, up to 12 months. Red is bad, green is good. And so you can see here that uh, we have the different kinds of dredging scenarios where we can see different kinds of recovery happening for those. So this is the first time that we've been able to get a sense of uh, what the impact of dredging is on the, the seagrasses, but also how we might modify that with different dredging windows. So, um, so that's, that's very helpful to us. So for seagrass meadows then subjected to uh, dredging stress, we can look at these ecological windows and we can obtain a fourfold reduction in recovery time and 35% reduction in extinction risk. Um, one of the other ways that we might look at the big data problem and how we analyse or how we, we do forecasting in this setup or modelling in this setup is the question of do we need to analyse all of the data? So we have a lot of data, a lot of quality issues. Um, we have the problem of uh, the challenge of computation, but if we know the problem that we actually want to answer, maybe we can step back and think about it as a design problem. So what we can do here is to borrow from the very rich literature on Bayesian experimental design, and we're going to try to find the design that maximises an expected utility function over a design space with respect to our model parameters and the future data. So I'll just describe this. If we can find a... We, so, we, so we set up a utility function. Um, so for example, the Shannon information gain. And then we can look at the difference between the prior and the posterior. And we can see whether for each... So what we're going to do is we're going to be, at a particular case, we're going to do this iteratively. So given some information now, I want to design, I want to choose a point out of my big data, I want to choose an observation um, that is going to give me the best utility. Okay, and I've set up this utility according to my goal, and so I'm going to choose that point, add that to my set of observations, and then I'm going to then choose the next point that's going to be best for my utility. Okay, so I'm going to have this adaptive design approach here. Now, what I can do then is what I've, what I've got is an idea of the optimal design and I can lay that design out over my data, my big data, extract the observations that I need from it and then analyse just those observations. And then if I want to look at model checking, uh, which is difficult if I've analysed all of the data, I can lay the design out again, pick up a replicate set of data, pick that up and, um, and analyse that, and so on and so on. So what this means then is that I'm only analysing the data that I need um, to answer my question. So I've gone from a big data question, a problem, to a design problem. Now the other thing that that does is if I lay my design out, and I can't find the observation that I needed from my design, that tells me something about the data set. It tells me that perhaps it's missing or it's biased, not representative or whatever. So that tells me something about the quality of the data that, um, that I have in answering this question. So um, in some cases I can't use, I can't find those data sets, so I need to actually look at sampling windows and I have near optimal designs. And so there's questions then about what impact that actually has. Um, so what we can do from this then is answer the questions of interest. We can look at sequential learning. We can assess data quality, assess model quality. And we can also think about our utility or loss function as incorporating some other features that we might care about. For example, um, model misspecification 
time constraints and so on. So just very quickly then, how many samples do I need to attain a certain level of precision? I won't go through the whole um, problem here, but um, what I will do is show you the answer, um, which is, um, and, and another problem, I'll just show you this other problem, sorry, which is um, on uh, mortgage default, so this is a logistic regression, we have a million records here, we want to identify important covariates for prediction, and we want to get accurate and precise estimates, and I will just show you the results here. So what we have then is if we do this designed approach, we don't need to analyse all the data. We only need to analyse about 3,000, uh, 3% of the full data set. We learn about these design holes, we learn about model robustness, and we have this runtime, but if we check that against having a runtime which we would need for just taking random samples of our data, we actually find that this designed approach is also better to give us the same kind of precision and to identify the important variables. So we think this is a promising approach, it's in its early days, and it will be very interesting to see how this really translates to a full forecasting um, problem. So, um, now the reason that I'm keen about doing something like this is this problem, and again, this is something that I would like your help. The ecology, is any, who's the ecology, from ecology here? So I can say the ecologists. So the ecologists I work with um, are very interested in this problem of transferability. Now this is known in traffic and it's known, obviously it's, it's forecasting by another name. What they want to do is there's a lot of information about the reef, the barrier reef, not much information about Ningaloo, which is over here and other reefs on Western Australia, and even less information in other parts of the world. How do we take the information that we know from the brief and translate it to the other parts of the world? And that transferability question is something that ecologists are really uh, trying to tackle now and could do with the insights that you have from your forecasting experience. So very happy to talk about that. And finally, looking forward in the last couple of minutes. I want to talk very briefly about some of the problems where we're trying to, to do some um, prediction uh, in the case of now informed priors. So very often we have information about a problem that we want to use and we need to use to give us good insights into um, the, the analysis and the inferences that we want to make. Look at these data here. These are a particular farm. In, um, in New South Wales by month. This is a, a plant pest infection. It's called banana bunchy top virus. Uh, it's very um, debilitating for our banana industry. We want to model that process there. These are observations where the, the um, disease has been found over time and we need to come up with an underlying model for this. So. This is what's happening over time. This is, we thought it was disappearing. This is January 2016 now. This is April. This is October. This is March. So you can see it's not disappearing. You need to do something about it. Um, these biosecurity problems are really important. We can set these up as a Bayesian hierarchical model by saying, what's the probability of the data given the incursion process and our data parameters? What's the probability of the incursion par par parameters given the process parameters? What's the parameter, the probability of the data and the process parameters? So we start building up our model in this uh, hierarchical manner and then we put it all together in a Bayesian framework. So if we do this then, what we find is that we have a prior for our, um, our pest. We then have surveillance data that we add to that and we end up with a posterior distribution which tells us about the, um, the, the um, extent and uh, area of freedom here and where to target surveillance. More importantly, or as importantly, we get parameters about the invasion, like colonisation time um, and growth rate. We also learn about host suitability and, importantly, inspector efficiency. So some of our inspectors, this is the probability of being able to detect uh, a pest 
the, uh, for some of our inspectors should, uh, are very good at their jobs and others we can find out from this modelling should um, have some sort of retraining. So, um, now the last one I will talk about just um, very quickly is where we're using informed priors uh, for monitoring the barrier reef. Uh, we have our traditional uh, data sources. The reef is though very long. And so it's 2,300 kilometres of reef and only some of those points are measured. How do we do prediction for the whole of the reef? Well, there are any number of divers out there taking photos of the reef from their dives. Who's a diver? Okay, who takes photos when they're diving? People? Right. So what we've done is create a virtual reef and where divers can geotag their photos, we can go into those photos and interrogate them, extract information from that, and then use that to improve our statistical models. So we can have on one virtual reef, where the photos are on there, you can go to the reef, you can download the photos from the reef onto your phone, for example, and then on the other um, panel, can imagine that we have a, um, a, a, a model, a map of the health of the reef, and that's being updated as the photos appear. Okay, so we're using informed um, or citizen science here to, uh, to give us information to help us do the modeling. So this kind of expert information and really informed priors is one other way that we might use um, uh, external information, combine it with our data in a, a data in a Bayesian framework to help us with um, these complex problems. So we've gone from looking backward to looking sideways to looking forward. There's more challenges than there have been solutions, but it's a very interesting journey and I'm hoping that some of you will have had some ideas about what we've been talking about or what I've been talking about and I'll be very pleased to discuss them. go on just a few minutes um, longer because we had a few technical hitches and, um, and Kerry shouldn't suffer because of that so we're, we, have, we have time for a couple of quick questions before we have to move on to our next session. So.